This is five on your side at four, focused on you. At this hour, we're learning more about the people who lived inside a home that burned down in the Metro East this morning. The fire left one person dead and two others in critical condition in Cahokia Heights. Crews responded to the burning home on Grand Street in Cahokia Heights about 8 a.m. Thanks for being here. I'm Kay Quinn. And I'm Brent Solomon. We're talking about a massive fire here. People driving along I-255 at Route 15 could see the flames. Five on your side, Travis Cummings is live in Cahokia Heights for us. And Travis, you caught up with people who knew the victim. Yeah, Kay Brent, but first, right here at this moment, eight hours later, state fire marshals are still on scene. Take a look over my shoulder here. Now, this came in as a two alarm fire around 730 this morning, but it turned out to be much more. We learned that one person died inside the home. Two others were taken to the hospital uh, wrestling with critical injuries, and we also learned that some of the the people who tried to rescue them were also injured. I want to get your eyes on this fire as all of this unfolded earlier today. Firefighters arrived to flames coming from the garage and in front of the home. They say it took them about 10 minutes to reach the residence because of how much stuff was inside and outside the home. When they finally got in, they found two people on the ground who were barely breathing and a third person who had died. And this afternoon, friends told us he was Bob Tierce, who everyone called Orange. They say the 78 year old was renting a room inside the home and was known for selling watermelon and oranges. His favorite pastimes, fishing, hunting, and the horse track. Always betting on something. He always had something to bet on. But he's a good heart person, always made you feel good and, and want to be loved by him. And he, he made sure that we all had a good uh, recognition of what he, he was able to do for us. Now it's unclear what caused the fire at this time, but officials described the house as a hoarder house. As you can see, there's so much stuff uh, inside and around that home that caught fire. They ran into paint and even bullets during the rescue. For now, we're live in Cahokia Heights. Travis Cummings, 5 on your side. Today, police are trying to track down the people who robbed a man working security at a downtown St. Louis parking garage. It all happened Friday night at the garage at 9th and Olive. Police say the victim saw two men in ski masks casing vehicles. The guard went to his office, called police. Then he went to the 12th floor and saw one of the suspects inside a Dodge Charger, the other standing outside armed with a gun. The suspect told the guard he would shoot him if he didn't hand over his property. That guard turned over his cell phones and left. One St. Charles County city has seen a major reduction in crime over the past several years. That's right, and we wanted to know what's contributing to that success. Here's live on your side's Mercedes McKay. Here in Lake St. Louis, the city has seen a 47% decrease of car break-ins and thefts of unlocked vehicles. The police chief tells me that a county task force has helped make that happen. The St. Charles County Criminal Interdiction Task Force was first created as a single auto theft task force a couple of years ago. Now the efforts have expanded and the success is showing in numbers. Not only have car break-ins decreased in Lake St. Louis, but the city also saw a 32% decrease in property crime and a 28% reduction in the total number of criminal charges issued. Lake St. Louis Police Chief tells me the regional collaboration of the task force is a major factor of their success. When you have one police department that's trying to take care of just their general area, um, you can be effective, but you're not as effective as when you pool all those resources to try to take care of the overall region. And I think that's where we found success. The St. Charles County Police tells me all of the departments that are a part of this task force are seeing similar reductions in crime. I'll have much more about that coming up at six. In Lake St. Louis, Mercedes McKay, five on your side. In about two hours, Missouri is scheduled to carry out the execution of death row inmate Leonard Taylor. He was convicted in the 2004 killings of his girlfriend, Angela Rowe, and her three young children, Alexis, Acrea, and Tyrese. Authorities believe Taylor shot Rowe during a violent argument.
then killed the children because they were witnesses. Taylor has always maintained his innocence. Former St. Louis County Prosecutor Bob McCullough, whose office prosecuted the case, says Taylor's claims of innocence are, quote, nonsense, and the evidence against him was overwhelming. Taylor will be the third person executed in Missouri in the past three months. Well, today marks 15 years since that deadly shooting at Kirkwood City Hall. Charles Cookie Thornton opened fire during a city council meeting, shooting police officers, council members, and the mayor back on February 7, 2008. Six people died that day. Thornton was shot and killed during a shootout with police. There will be a memorial at City Hall tonight at 7. Today, one group rallying against a controversial Missouri bill involving how sexual orientation is referred to in the school setting. In fact, a Senate committee held a hearing this afternoon on the Vulnerable Child Compassion and Protection Act. Opponents call it the Don't Say Gay Bill. The proposal says teachers, school nurses, and principals cannot discuss gender identity or sexual orientation at all unless they're a licensed mental health care provider with the parent's prior permission to do so. Current state law already allows parents to opt out of any sex education classes that they don't feel comfortable with. All right, turning to your weather first forecast, we saw some light showers this morning. But that's apparently nothing compared to what we're expecting tomorrow. Chief Meteorologist Scott Connell tracking the incoming rain. Scott. Yeah, and Kay, it's not an all day rain tomorrow. In the morning hours, most of us will probably be on the quiet side around St. Louis, but by this time tomorrow afternoon, the rain is here. Some of it tomorrow evening could be heavy at times too. Right now, just the clouds around St. Louis and even a few breaks and thin spots in that overcast from time to time. There's a lot to see a little bit of sunshine. It's also allowed our temperatures to get back into the mid 50s this afternoon. Relatively comfortable. It is cooler though as you head to the south and south these and that's where on the radar screen your weather first Doppler radar is showing some rain down to the south. Farmington hasn't had a huge amount, but it's been damp and we do expect to see more showers continuing across southern portions of Missouri. We're basically waiting on this next surge of moisture and that really will make its appearance felt as we head into tomorrow afternoon. Right now we're talking about a mainly cloudy sky and most of us this evening will stay dry, certainly in the metro area, but rain will be returning later on Wednesday. The heaviest rain Wednesday night and the strong winds overnight Wednesday. There is a flood watch in effect down in Madison, Iron and Reynolds counties going from tomorrow into Thursday. We'll see you in a few minutes, Kay. All right, thank you, Scott. Today, a longtime community organizer received a big honor from the city of St. Louis. She had a street named after her. This morning, a stretch of Park Avenue between South Cardinal Avenue and Montrose Avenue was named Ollie Stewart Way. She's known for creating the Southside Wellness Center, a place where senior citizens and developmentally disabled adults can get services and resources. Stewart is 90 years old now and has remained a force in the community. She also um, has always been a fighter, as we all know, and has continuously not only fighter for the neighborhood, but for not only the seniors, but the young adults and anybody else in the community. There is not one person that I have not seen her encourage, challenge, or take on and give an opportunity. Stewart's other achievements include the reopening of Loventure Middle School and maintaining Booter Recreation Center. Way to go.